Well, this week I've titled it Create This. I've come up with a very creative title, End Time Stuff. Um, that's because I was standing up here and realized, uh oh, I hadn't titled my presentation today. So, uh, and some, for some reason, that is why some people watch it and some people don't based on the title. So, I, uh, I guess I should get very sensationalistic, whether it's in my presentation or not. We talk each week about all the different things that seem to be happening in our world that uh, are converging, all these different signs and stage settings that are taking place uh, at a very rapid place, and everything is converging. And we know that eventually it will converge uh, at the second coming of Christ. Uh, all these things will, become, will come to final fulfillment. In the meantime, there will be things fulfilled uh, here and there. And um, one of the verses that we use quite a bit is a sort of a, a building on what Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 24, which is probably the biggest indicator that we live in the end times is uh, false teaching in the church and growing apostasy. We know that in 2 Thessalonians 2, it clearly says, unmistakably says, that there will be a great falling away uh, in the end times. And we as I've said many times before, that falling away will not come all at once. It will be built upon over a period of time. And if I look around, I know other people that I talk to look around, that's probably the single greatest indicator that we live near the time of the Lord's return is the false teaching that's coming out of the church. I could sit here each week and I could do two or three hours on just examples that came up from the past week about what's going on. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul also, in the last, last thing he wrote before he was executed, martyred for the Lord, said this, 2 Timothy 4 verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, out in uh, Claremont, California, it's my in-laws uh, live there, a uh, town next door to it in Upland, and there's a very lovely campus. It's called the Claremont Colleges, uh, Claremont Institute, Claremont College, and they also have a school of the Claremont School of Theology there. Um, it's a... It's a very beautiful campus, very pastoral, great little college town uh, there in Southern California. A number of years ago, a man named Lincoln and his wife uh, gave $40 million to Claremont to establish a school of theology that was a little bit different than the school of theology that was already there. Claremont School of Theology itself is a Methodist affiliated, um, United Methodist affiliated institution. Uh, in fact, that's what it says here, uh, this Claremont Lincoln University. Claremont Lincoln University is a spinoff of a traditional divinity school, the Methodist-affiliated Claremont School of Theology. And back in 2011, I did a little bit of a presentation on this and talked about some of the things that were going on there. They had a school uh, for Jain Jainism, which is a Eastern mystical religion, uh, mainly based in, I believe, Sri Lanka. Uh, they were having interfaith instruction in the three monotheist, monotheistic faiths, Christianity, Judaism, and uh, Islam. And this was in the New York Times yesterday, and I just thought it was, this is kind of encapsulates a lot of the things that I've been talking about for years, about how all of these false teachings kind of merge and come out of the same uh, bad tree. Um, here, just re look at what this article says. That Claremont Lincoln looks nothing like a traditional divinity school seems fitting. In fact, the title of the article in the New York Times religion page yesterday is Theology Schools Look to Each Other in the Web to Survive. That Claremont Lincoln University looks nothing like a traditional divinity school seems fitting. Its classes are online only, with students logging in from all over, and its offices are a command central for curriculum planning and marketing. No actual teaching happens there. Do you see the phrase, though? Curriculum planning and marketing. This is what the church has become. This is what the evangelical church has become. And I've given you many examples just in the last few weeks 
of what happens. They have these massive conferences like Catalyst and Willow Creek Leadership Summit, and they're really, a, they're really an outgrowth of leadership network. Uh, they're tied into Fuller University, and Leadership Network was designed to, to devise marketing plans for church growth. Uh, in fact, Claremont, the Claremont colleges uh, were affiliated, in some respect, with Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker is the non-Christian who is behind the marketing principles, the marketing plans, that have been put out by Leadership Network and that have infected almost every aspect of the evangelical church today. That's why you could hear Andy Stanley say a couple weeks ago that you know if you if you want to go to a small church, you're you're cheating your children, you're selfish, because they really sh you should go to a big church. Because of course the big church is much better at whatever it is because they have a better light show, and staging and that type of thing. A great apologist friend of mine, uh, I won't identify him, he, we were together going to dinner once and he pointed to a church, it was in Palm Springs, he said, this is the biggest church in the valley out here. And it's great. I mean, I went there last Sunday and I got to tell you, John, the pastor was really rocking and he was really bringing it. But then the fog machine malfunctioned and it kind of destroyed the whole, the whole thing. And he was being very cynical, obviously, very sarcastic. And he was right, because that's really, um, that's really where the church has become. But this, I want you to remember what I told you about. Leadership Network is really where that their principles, their marketing principles led to a thing that we call the emergent or emerging church that's tried to layer postmodernism on the Bible, and it's been a disaster theologically and doctrinally. It's not, in many sense, even remotely Christian, but I want you to remember Emerging Church and Leadership Network as I go through this. So here's some more about Claremont Lincoln. Most of its 70 students do not plan to be members of the clergy. And while the university offers classes called mindfulness, that's Eastern mysticism, collaboration, this is Hegelian dialectic, dialogue, same thing, it has none no classes on, say, the Old Testament, the Gospels, or the Quran. Instead, the classes are intended to, quote, develop capacities for compassionate leadership according to its mission statement. And this is what leadership, now, this, is, this is the um, illegitimate offspring of leadership network. This, this is what it's come to. But this is, as you will see, the article talks about this is becoming the design for divinity and theology schools all over the country because they're dying. Nobody wants to go there. Now, I would suggest to you that nobody wants to go there because they're, they're just getting a bunch of nonsense they can get in any MBA program. The article continues, the idea behind the classes is that in a multicultural society uh, such as ours, the right habits and tools matter more than specific knowledge which is something that can be acquired elsewhere. It used to be you would go to college to get knowledge. Now you get it, I guess, uh, online and, and through Twitter. Uh, and so if you're not getting knowledge, I guess just come and hang out and we'll drink really cool coffees and that type of thing. And uh, here's what the president says. We have moved past the knowledge piece, said Dr. Aranda, the president, a former management consultant with an MBA but no training in religion. While Claremont Lincoln has been extreme in jettisoning the knowledge piece, listen to this, it is not alone in sensing that divinity schools need to change to survive. And I would suggest to you it is that exact same thinking that's infecting the church, that the churches need to change to survive. They need to change. And they always say, well, we're, but ultimately what happens is what do they do? They change the message. They water down the message. And that's the falling away. That's, that's what it looks like. We're seeing it happen right in front of our eyes. According to a study released this week by the Association of Theological Schools, that's the accrediting agency for seminaries, uh, they're the ones that put in, these in place the requirements for spiritual formation uh, that has led to a lot of this melding of psychology and mysticism in 
evangelical seminaries all over the country. According to a study by the ATS, 55% of its member schools have declining enrollments. The students are aging too. By 2020, there may be more 50 plus students than 20 somethings. In response, seminaries and divinity schools are in a period of unprecedented experimentation. Schools are merging or joining together across religious lines in interfaith consortiums or moving online. Now, in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, there's a rhetorical question asked, and since the knowledge piece has gone from a lot of these divinity schools, so in case any one of the students or faculty there is listening, a rhetorical question is one to which the answer is obvious. So there's a rhetorical question asked in Luke chapter 18, verse 8. It says, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And the answer should be obvious if we're really paying attention to what's going on. And the answer, to, I think, is obvious is, if he doesn't hurry up, maybe not. Because we're all subject to this. But now listen, here's the, here's the money part. Next fall, Christian Theological Seminary in Indianapolis, which is affiliated with the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, the nomination is starting an option for its Masters of Divinity program that will be in person but not fixed in one place. While half the classes will meet on will be on campus, students will also meet for week-long intensive classes in different cities where the professor lives or decides to teach the class. Here's the from the developer. One course will happen in LA because we have a few professors there, said Doug Paget, an evangelical pastor who is helping to design the program. Doug Padgett is one of the leaders of the emerging church that came out of the Leadership Network design. He is, um, I don't have enough time to go through problems with Doug Padgett. He continues, we are trying to solve three problems at once. How do you have a national draw? How do you have a national draw in a program that doesn't suffer from the limitations of the online learning environment, and how do you drive the price down? What's missing from that? Teaching them theology and truth, right, and doctrine, and what the Bible says. And for schools that eliminate traditional classes in scripture theology, the article continues, it is hard to guarantee that students are well-grounded in their own traditions. Most religious leaders believe that interfaith dialogue with the best of intentions, can be vacuous if students are not sufficiently learned. I agree. And one, Dr. Hunt added, there are glorious possibilities with online education. We are getting ready to graduate the first group of online MDiv students, she said. We have someone in the Congo who is a UN peacekeeper and someone living in Palestine in the same class. Can you imagine the experience in that class because of what those people bring? And listen, this is exactly what those of us who've been warning about the emerging church and the effect that it's had, and, and listen, I heard people say the emerging church is gone, it's dead, it has no more influence. That's nonsense. It won. And so what becomes more important than theology, doctrine, and truth is experience. And so now we have institutions that are basing their whole curriculum around experience. That's a problem. Interesting article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday, machines that will think and feel. Artificial intelligence is still in its infancy, and that should scare us, argues David Greitner. Listen to just some of the things that are said in this article. Artificial intelligence prophets, prophets envision human-like intelligence with a, within a few decades. Not expertise at a single specified task only, but the flexible, wide-ranging intelligence that Alan Turing foresaw in a 1950 paper proposing the test for machine intelligence that still bears his name. Once we have figured out how to build artificial minds with the average human IQ of 100, before long, we will build machines with IQs of 500 and 5,000. The potential good and bad consequences are staggering. Humanity's future is at stake. Robots with superhuman intelligence are as dangerous, potentially, as nuclear bombs. Yet they are the national, natural outcome of robots with ordinary intelligence, which are, in turn, the goal of AI researchers working hard right now all over the world. 
So where do we stand? How long before we arrive at these hugely dangerous computers? For now, we are not even headed in the right direction. AI today is nowhere near understanding the human mind. It's trying to get to California, so to speak, without ever leaving I-95. Now, for those of, who have been to college recently, I-95 is on the East Coast and runs north and south, so you can never get to California on I-95, okay? Just thought it would Google it, get Google Maps open on your phone, pinch it in, you can see the whole U.S. at one time, and, and you'll understand what he was writing about. Um, but a breakthrough won't be hard. We only need to look at things from a slightly different angle, which might happen in 100 years or this afternoon. Once it does, we had better start following developments as, as carefully as we would monitor lab technicians playing with plague bacteria. And this is a problem because the ethical standards have not developed. They were talking about this at Davos a, a couple months ago at the World Economic Forum. And people are talking about all these things we're going to do. And listen, this is really Tower of Babel type stuff. Men who think they're going to make ourselves like gods, we're going to achieve immortality. And remember, in the, I think it's in my convergence slide at the beginning, is a picture of Time Magazine from about four years ago saying, 2045, the year man becomes immortal. Because they think they will actually achieve that. And that's what happened at the Tower of Babel. And listen, God intervened then, and he's going to intervene now. And, but in the meantime, it's very dangerous, and people need to watch. Now this week, uh, President Obama, in a clever move, came and nominated um, Merrick Garland for the United States Supreme Court slot that opened up when Justice Scalia passed away. He, is, he would be, if confirmed, the fourth Jewish justice on the United States Supreme Court out of nine, which is kind of interesting. Now. The question is, what, what kind of guy is he? Now, the newspapers were almost universal. Oh, man, look at Obama. He's so clever. He picked a centrist. He picked a moderate. On what basis did they make that claim? Uh, it must be feeling. <laughs> because it's not based on facts. Facts would lead to a different conclusion. And what you will see is nonsense such as this little clip from CBS News the other morning talking about this. And listen to this and see if you can pick up the incoherent nonsense in this reporter's comment. Garland is a moderate, a centrist. Now, I mean, he's certainly liberal, but by no means is he some kind of liberal flamethrower. Okay. Can I play it one more time? Just... It's kind of funny, really. Garland is a moderate, a centrist. Now, I mean, he's certainly liberal, but by no means is he some kind of liberal flamethrower. Okay, so he's a moderate, a centrist, and a liberal, but not a liberal flame flamethrower. No, what he does is he's not a flamethrower. He just throws more wood on the fire that's burning down the institutions of our government and country. Can we be honest? Uh, the National Labor Relations Board, when he was on the Court of Appeals in the D.C. Circuit. And look, I'm not saying he's not a nice guy. That's not the point, okay? The point is his orientation and how he views the Constitution. National Labor Relations Board cases come up, and listen, the National Labor Relations Board has been out of control for a long time. Ask business people, okay? So how do you think in the 16 cases he's made a decision on, how has he voted? In favor of the National Labor Relations Board, 16 to 0. Another important decision that came up was the D.C. case that said that you had the individual right to bear arms. That was decided by the Supreme Court in a 5 to 4 decision. But when he was on the D.C. circuit, he didn't like what the panel wanted. He wanted to hear the whole case. Why? Because he wanted to overturn the individual right to bear arms. He doesn't believe in what the Constitution says. And you'll see all kinds of... News, the, the same newspapers that will call him a centrist, back when that decision came down in, two, I think it was 2008, they said, oh, look at this, look at the activist Supreme Court upholding, uh, uh, changing the Constitution. They were just upholding the Constitution, the plain sense of the document. But this is where we live. This is postmodernism and all this stuff infecting the institutions of our government. And they're being torn and burned down. And 
he may be a very nice guy, okay? And he may just throw some more logs on the fire and not be the flamethrower. Okay, fine. He's still burning it down. So personally, I would give him a hearing, and then I would vote him down if I was in charge. And so all these things saying, uh, for example, one editorial, Garland's dissents are an exercise in restraint. Um, and of course, anything that the that the Congress or the Republicans would do is GOP obstructionism. So I say, okay, give them a hearing and then vote no. Um, now, I would say that with some fear and trepidation that the people that would make the decision would hold the line because I don't believe that they would. Most of them, a lot of them, because uh, I haven't seen them do much of that anyway. So let's look at the economy for just a moment. Um, the one thing that I found this week as I looked at economic things is nobody can figure out what's going on. The fundamentals seem to be all out of whack. The dollar's going down, currencies are going up, negative interest rates, and then this, like in, in China, in one province, their home, look at how their home prices have increased just in the last year. And they're coming into places like Vancouver and spending $4 million for a, a teardown home. A teardown. I mean, I've seen pictures of these homes. You, you wouldn't pay $25,000 for this, but the Chinese are coming in. They're laundering their money out of China. Now they're going into the Los Angeles area, and they're buying up properties at a pretty good clip. They're increasing. They're creating a bubble there, too. And the, in, what happens to bubbles? Usually they burst. They always burst. So, and then this is just an article, higher commodity prices lift global shares as dollar dives. Oil's going up, oil's going down, drilling's not happening, bankruptcies are happening, but the oil's getting better, and it's all very confusing, and it's hard to know exactly what to do. So, try to find a plan, I guess, if you're trying to figure out what to do and stick to it. <laughs> and uh, it would appear that it's going to be a bit of a rocky ride. Um, let's see, that's for a later moment. Here's an interesting article, a front page of the Wall, uh, Wall Street Business and Finance section the other day. J.P. Morgan calls wealthy herd. J.P. Morgan Chase & Company is making its private banking, private bank even more private. Clients of the firm's private bank later this year will be required to have at least $10 million in investable assets, twice the current minimum of $5 million, said people familiar with the matter. But look at what it says here. J.P. Morgan's restructuring of the unit, their private banking unit, also reflects broader trends that are reshaping Wall Street, including banks' ambivalence towards deposits in a period of low interest rates. So this is why they're putting out negative interest rates, because they, they want you to spend money, because that's what's going to drive the economy. But the problem is we have a maturing population in most, almost every culture of the world, all the major economic cultures of the world. And so what happens when you get to be 50, 60 years old? You pretty much have everything that you want, right? So you don't buy things. Older people don't spend as much money. They save. Well, they don't want you to save. So they're going to try to force you by making negative interest rates. It just, the whole thing is just, uh, you know, now people are buying dollars, and it's just, the whole thing is just kind of a, a mess. I talked about this last year uh, or so, this whole transgender thing. It really had its genesis in, in medical schools or medical colleges or hospitals at John Hopkins. And at John Hopkins was a man named McHugh, and he was a doctor of psychiatry, and he supported this. They, they, they did the first sex reassignment surgeries at John Hopkins. And so now everybody in culture is, oh, isn't this great? We're going to do this, and you can choose whatever you want, and you can be male this day and female the next, and it doesn't matter which bathroom or locker room you use and that type of thing, and we just want to be kind and loving and all this other stuff. So I'm going to give huge props to the American College of Pediatricians, which came out recently with this statement. Gender ideology harms children. The American College of Pediatricians urges educators and legislators 
to reject all policies that condition children to accept as normal a life of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex. Facts, not ideology, determine reality. Amen to that. <laughs> Props to the American College of Pediatricians. And you can see that this was signed by Michelle Fratella, the president, Quentin Van Meter, the vice president, and then Paul McHugh, the doctor that I talked to you about, distinguished service professor of psychiatry at John Hopkins Medical School, and the former psychiatrist in chief at John Hopkins Hospital. And he came out, the article I mentioned a couple year, a year or so ago, and said, this is not good. In fact, here's what they say. One of their conclusions, according to the DSM, as many as 98% of gender-confused boys and 88% of gender-confused girls eventually accept their biological sex after naturally passing through puberty. That's right. That's the, that's the scientific fact. And all these, what's the word I'm looking for? Stupid educators, stupid legislatures, and stupid government officials are ignoring biology. And they call us crazy? They're nuts. They're insane. They're, well, really, they're evil. And they're destroying lives by doing this. And nobody ever holds them accountable. And it's, it disgusts me. What a conclusion. Rates of suicide are 20 times greater among adults who use cross-sex 20 times. Two zero. Even in Common Core math, you can figure that out. 20 times greater among adults. I'm getting them all today. Like, she called this machine gun end time stuff. Uh, who use cross sex hormones and undergo sex reassignment surgery, even in Sweden, which is among the most LGBTQ affirming countries. What compassionate and reasonable person would condemn young people to this, children to this state? knowing that after puberty, as many as 88% of girls and 98% of boys will eventually accept reality and achieve a state of mental and physical health. I'll tell you who would do it. Child abusers. People so blinded by their religious leftist belief that they can't even see the facts right in front of their face. Number, last conclusion I'll share. Conditioning children into believing a lifetime of chemical and surgical impersonation of the opposite sex is normal and healthful, is child abuse. Okay, you know what? Prosecute these idiots. Put them in jail so they can't hurt other kids. We're all about child abuse. Takes a village. <laughs> Endorsing gender discordance as normal via public education and legal policies will confuse children and parents, leading more children to present to gender clinics. This, in turn, virtually ensures that they will likely consider unnecessary surgical mutilation of their healthy body parts as young adults. Now, you can go over to thinkprogress.org, a leftist organization. What do they say? Forcing kids to stick to gender roles can actually be harmful to their health. Okay? That's child abuse. Right there. Okay. Now we're going to do Middle East and... Some of the stuff going on there. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm actually finish a little bit ahead today. I know, I'm just warning you in advance so you don't, you know, people don't have the vapors or whatever and that type of thing because we don't want to, we just don't have enough oxygen, spare oxygen around here. So just be careful uh, if I get that be done earlier. <laughs> Hollow, this is from The Economist. Hollow superpower, Putin. Well, Putin made, he kind of upset everybody's apple cart this week. As he said, we're withdrawing from Syria. Now, first, let's, let's get it straight. He's not withdrawing. He's with, withdrawing a large chunk of his ground troops. He's going to keep his naval base. He's going to keep his air base. Now, my assessment of it, that's what he wanted. He wanted a base there so he could project power throughout the Middle East, and he got it. So he propped up the Assad regime a little bit gave him a chunk of land where Putin gets the things that he wants, and now he's taking his troops and going home for the most part. But it's very interesting, and, and I, 
I don't have the graphic, but you remember in Star Trek where Spock would play uh, spatial chess, you know, the chess was three-dimensional? Putin's mastered that, okay? He is like five moves ahead of everybody else. And it's because of his training. They were trained in deception, the art of deception. And so you've got to be very careful about what he does because there's always a subtext. But let's first look at what some other people say, and then I'll kind of give you my conclusion. Look close, however, and Russia's victory rings hollow. Islamic State remains. The peace is brittle. Even optimists doubt that diplomacy in Geneva will prosper to try to get a peace agreement. Mr. Putin's claim that his forces have fulfilled their main mission in Syria was revealing. Gone was any attempt to cling to the fiction. Remember when he went in, what did he say? We're going in to beat ISIS. And everybody, all these people said, thank the Lord that there's a guy like Putin, a great Christian leader who's going to do exactly what he says. And he didn't. He didn't do any of that. He got you. Okay? Hopefully, if you were listening to this, you would say, don't believe him. And all the, all the reports from the Institute for the Study of War that I've shown show you the airstrikes. They were never hard, they were hardly ever in the ISIS areas, ISIS-controlled areas. If they were, they were always unconfirmed. The only confirmed ones were in the rebel areas because he wanted to clean that area out, create a little buffer so Assad could have the land where he has his naval base and his air base. So, Don was any attempt to claim to the fiction that the intervention had been priorly aimed at hitting Islamic State rather than to preserve the imperiled regime of Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian dictator. Mr. Putin has exhausted an important tool of propaganda. Russia's president has generated stirring images of war to persuade his anxious citizens that their ailing country is once again a great power first in Ukraine and recently over the skies of Aleppo. The big question for the West is where he will stage his next drama. And look, I don't, don't anybody write to me and tell me you know, who owns The Economist. I know that, okay? I understand that. I put that through my filter. Mr. Putin's Russia is more fragile than he pretends. The economy is failing. The rise in oil prices after 2000 when Mr. Putin first became president provided $1.1 trillion of windfall export revenues for him to spend as he wished. But oil prices are three-quarters down from their peak. Russian belts have tightened further because of sanctions imposed after Mr. Putin attacked Ukraine. Living standards in Russia have fallen for the past two years and are falling still. The average salary in January 2014 was $8.50 a month. A year later, it was $4.50. That's not very good. What does this mean for the West? So far... For, uh, this is uh, FBC Disco here. Uh, you want me to just continue? Okay. The, uh, oh, not, you continue with the, the thing, okay. Okay, what does this mean for the West? So far, America, as least, has understood Mr. Putin's aims. In the autumn, Mr. Obama predicted that Syria would be a Russian quagmire. Uh, speaking to the Atlantic recently, recently, he argued that Russia, I talk, talked about that uh, interview last week, he argued that Russia's repeated resort to force is a sign of weakness. That is true, but not, as Mr. Putin suggests, because it shows that Mr. Putin cannot achieve his foreign policy goals by persuasion. For him, military action is an end of itself. He needs footage of warplanes to fill his news bulletins. There will be no quagmire in Syria because the Kremlin is not in the business of nation building. So get, what you get from that is Obama really got it wrong. He, he didn't understand what was going on. So he either didn't understand because he doesn't know, or he, he didn't understand because, he, or he didn't understand because he's a, a plant, which I've suspected for some time. Because he's, I mean, ask you what he's done that has not helped further the uh, Russian agenda. I mean, it really isn't much. So the biggest test will be Ukraine a focus of Russian attention, and also the country most likely, most like Russia itself. If Ukraine can become a successful European state, it will show de Russians that they have a path to liberal democracy. If, by contrast, Ukraine becomes a failed state, it will strengthen the Kremlin's argument that Russia belongs to its own orthodox culture and that liberal dem democracy has nothing to teach it. So, translational of all that is, he really pulled a fast one on everybody. 
He got what he wanted. He achieved it. It may be that you know, Russia's having pretty severe economic problems because of the price, fall of the price of oil. That had made something to do about it. But this, this thing in Syria remains a major problem. This whole Islamic thing remains a problem. For example, here's a study that came out this week. Between Sharia and democracy, Islamic education in North America by the Institute for Monitoring Peace and Cultural Tolerance, Tolerance and School Education. Islamic education, they've found, and it's reported, they found that in the United States, education in the United States is hostile to who? Israel. Distorts conflict, the report shows. In fact, they do a series of maps. For example, this is from the grade four uh, a textbook called I Love Islam. And it shows what, what's, what's the country there? Palestine. Now, the only mention of Israel is up there. See up there, it says that the Golan Heights occupied by Israel. Well, where's Israel? And there's a number of examples that they use in this report to show that people just don't understand what's going on. Another area that they don't understand is this migration um, of, of people to Europe. I'll talk about a little bit more about that in a moment. The other thing that's happening now is there's all of a sudden there's been a, a, a rise of terrorist attacks within Turkey. Now, I have no proof of this. It's just my speculation based on what's going on. I personally think that what's going on is that Putin had a falling out with Iran. He stopped delivery of the S-300 missiles. He's upset with Iran. Why? What is Iran doing that's upset? what could upset Putin? They're pumping oil like crazy, further depressing the oil price in the markets. Because they've been out of the markets because of sanctions for a while, and they probably have the, the ability to produce oil at a cheaper cost than any place else on the planet. You know, you just essentially stick a pipe in the ground, and there you go, and a little pump, and they're ready to go. So it's affecting Russia, and I, I personally think what Putin is doing now is playing off Iran against Turkey, but I think what he's going to do, the, the risk is that he will help them join together, which is kind of an interesting thing because Turkey is Sunni, uh, Iran is Shia, but what do they have in common other than you know, their own version of Islam and their hatred for each other, supposedly? They have a problem in Kurdistan. And so all of these terror attacks in Ankara now are being claimed to be the result of actions by Kurdish separatist parties that want their own state of Kurdistan. And so I think what Putin is doing is he's letting, he's going to have Turkey and Iran kind of play off on the Kurdish problem and keep, because he, he doesn't want Turkey move, looking up towards his country. He wants to keep them occupied and busy, and they will be occupied and busy. He'll protect his little section of Syria, but he, now he's got Persia and Turkey, I'm, Iran and Turkey, uh, playing off against, the, uh, actually maybe even cooperating. So that, I think, has some potential prophetic implications. But the fact that Russia is withdrawing, I wouldn't write too much into it. Like, oh, Ezekiel 38 will never happen. I don't think it makes any difference there. Because he's got his base in his airfield right there in the mountains north of, in, in, air, in areas north of Israel. So I don't, that's not changed, and that's not going to change at this point. Uh, he also did the U.S. a favor in some respects. So I see that uh, my slides are a little bit out of order here. So, so this migration thing, just a, m a little bit about that. It continues to be a problem. They've closed off routes, and guess what? Now Turkey or Greece is being overrun. So the EU is trying to step in to make an agreement with Turkey to bring them into the EU and pay them money to stop the flow of immigrants. And so this week we saw a number of headlines about how miserable it is. And so now they're trying to, uh, this high degree, the New York Times article, a high degree of miserable, miserable in refugees uh, swollen Greece. 
a high degree of miserable in refugee swollen Greece. There, got it right that time. Um, and they're trying to bargain over what are we going to do? Uh, Turkey apparently has reached an agreement that they're going to accept these people, but who knows? So all of this plays into the fact that you know Putin is again playing this Syrian thing off. Uh, a lot of people are just like they don't know what's going to happen in Syria because of this. But look, he, you need to understand when Putin went into Syria, this is what the Syrian map looked like. The orangish areas there on the left and up near Aleppo are Syrian government-held regions. The green areas are rebel-held re regions. The yellow is the regions of uh, the Kurdish forces. And the gray area is the Islamic State. Now, his stated purpose back in July of 2015 was to reduce the influence of the Islamic State. So here's a map from March 15th. Okay, Kurds have more, they've consolidated a little bit around Aleppo, they haven't really taken much land, the rebels are in their same place, the Kurds have more, but who else has more? Here's what it looked like, Islamic State is the gray area in July, oh that should say July 31st, 2015, and this should say March 15th, 2016. So we'll just do a, like a little the which thing, and we'll make those correct. Uh, but look what it's like now. So ISIS has more, Kurds have more. And so that's why I think Russia is using this Kurdish thing, because neither Turkey nor Iran want a Kurdish state. And Iraq also has a lot of Kurds in its territory. It's a, they're the largest people group on the planet without their own country. So um, in uh, Stratford, they, they analyze things this way. Clearly, Russia's involvement in Syria has helped change loyalist fortunes for the better. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that Russia's contribution has been only part of the greater support loyalist forces have received since September 2015. Iran figures prominently and, the, and likely even more decisively in that support. The Russian drawdown in Syria will certainly affect the loyalist forces' overall progress, prowess, Iran and Hezbollah have given no indication that they will also reduce their forces. As long as the Russian withdrawal is the only one on the horizon, the Syrian loyalist forces should be able to maintain their current military advantage. So, as I said, I think there's this thing going on, and even the Washington Post today has an article, or yesterday has an article on uh, Aleppo, and they have this picture. One is a picture taken the other day, in Aleppo, the other is a picture taken the other day in Aleppo, so because it's kind of on the fault line. So there are parts of Aleppo where people go about their normal daily routines. They go to college and university classes. They go to the grocery store, and literally down the block, it's rubble uh, because Assad has been very clever in the way they do that. The other thing that's playing into all of this is the supply of oil. I've used this graphic a number of times. In that triangle is about, uh, by most estimates, 56 to 60 percent of the world's known supply of oil. And it's probably the oil that can be reached most easily at a lower cost. The interesting thing is that that area, light green is Sunni, dark green is Shia. You see that most of that oil is held in Shia areas. And that's why even in the Saudi Arabian area there on the west side of the Persian Gulf, that's in a Shia, their oil is in a Shia dominant, uh, an area that is uh, predominantly Shia. So they have a problem with the Shia people now. Iraq is a, lar a large portion, especially down around Baghdad, is Shia. And so there's this conflict, internal conflict going on, and it's a thing. So, then some of the other people, they looked at what was going on this week with Russia, in addition to what I've speculated about, sort of playing off Iran and Turkey and making them take care of the problem and spend the money to take care of the problem and deal with the Kurdistan issue and help the Kurds maybe make some terrorist attacks here and there in Turkey. And so, you know, he's got Iran and Turkey kind of preoccupied with other things. So he doesn't have to spend money. He gets his base. He gets his naval base. 
and he's back in his villa in Moscow plotting what he's going to do next. Here's an a article in the Financial Times that was based on a, a talk that was given at a forum recently. What if Russia cut gas supplies to Europe? Now, what does this have to do with anything? Give me just a moment and I'll explain. Uh, this is also in Sputnik. Europe will face catastrophe if Russia cast, uh, cuts off gas supplies. There was a, 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 a speech by Nick Butler at Corpus Christi College at Cambridge University in England, and it was called the Nightmare Series Lecture. You think my stuff is hard to take? And that, that, maybe that's the title for next week, Nightmare Update. Um, and so listen to what it says. Moscow's attempt to compensate for declining European gas demand by ramping up exports to China have so far got nowhere. Imagine then a nightmare scenario in which Vladimir Putin, Russia's president, reacted to these pressures by launching a foreign policy adventure similar to the 2008 war against Georgia, which nobody ever talks about anymore, which everybody forgets, the 2014 annexation of Crimea, in the recent intervention in Syria's civil war. What might he do and how would he, we would respond? Were this to happen, the disruption to the economies of Western Europe, even Germany, the main importer of Russian gas, would not be particularly severe, Butler thought. It might be worse than some of the EU's central and eastern member states. Remember, they used to be part of a, the Soviet bloc, but it would still be manageable. Were this to happen, to this, um, the country to suffer the most would be Ukraine, where territories under the Kiev government's control would be vulnerable to a Russian and Donbass separatist squeeze on coal and electricity as well as gas supplies. Kiev might declare a two-day working week to save energy. What happens then? Their economy collapses. Ukraine would plunge towards economic collapse, and huge numbers of Ukrainians might flee westwards into Poland, Germany, and beyond as refugees from Syria and elsewhere are doing now. Now remember the, um, the report that I had here a couple weeks ago of this man. Let's back this up. This is the uh, Supreme Commander of NATO Forces in Europe, the American uh, Craig Breedlove, General. To the south, from the Levant through North Africa, Europe faces a complicated mix of mass migration spurred by state instability and state collapse and masking the movement of criminals, terrorists, and foreign fighters. Within this mix, Aish, uh, ISIL, or Daesh as I call them, is spreading like a cancer, taking advantage of paths of least resistance, threatening European nations and our own with terrorist attacks. Its brutality is driving millions to flee from Syria and Iraq, creating an almost unprecedented humanitarian challenge. Russia's entry into the fight in Syria has wildly exacerbated the problem, changing the dynamic in the air and on the ground. Despite public pronounces to the contrary, Russia has done little to counter Daesh, but a great deal to bolster the Assad regime and its allies. And together, Russia and the Assad regime are deliberately weaponizing migration from Syria in an attempt to overwhelm European structures and break European resolve. And that's what they did. They bombed cities and they got people on the move, as he said in his testimony uh, to a congressional committee in uh, a couple months, about a month and a half ago. And I think he's right. And so what Putin now will likely do, he may try this with Ukraine and get more people on the move. And Europe will be distracted and he'll be sitting there protecting himself with a declining, comp com uh, declining economy or a troubled economy, in declining population, and bad demographics, but he will at least be able to uh, preserve his power for a time. And this, I think, fits into the prophetic scenario very well, is it, it does talk about Russia being drawn down in, I'll put a hook in your jaw and I'll draw you down in, or this great northern power that will be drawn down in. And I think this is, this is a good possibility that this is what is being set up. So rather than say, oh, this is equal 38 thing will never happen now, I think it's probably more likely now than it ever was because of the way Russia's acting. Um, so real quick, I'll just finish with this. Um, let me just see here. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. 
we'll do we'll do a couple quick things. There's Caroline Glick, and what she does in her article uh, in the Jerusalem Post, the Obama Doctrine Unplugged. Remember we played that article, or the we talked a lot about the article, the interview with Jeffrey Goldberg in the Atlantic, the Obama Doctrine, and Obama was talking about. Uh, I know you were surprised and shocked that he was talking about how great he was and how much smarter he was than everybody else, and how clever he was, and how he had everything figured out. So the interesting thing is, the day that article comes out, Caroline makes a great point. It was ironic that the day the Atlantic Monthly published what was supposed to be the definitive work on U.S. Barack Obama's foreign policy, President Vladimir Putin announced that he was removing the bulk of his military forces from Syria. Jeffrey Goldberg's long profile titled The Obama Doctrine sought to define the theoretical underpinning of Obama's foreign policy. Goldberg devoted, devoted the bulk of his 20,000-word corpus to analyzing Obama's policies in Syria, where he offered, Obama finally broke free from foreign policy community constraints and set out on his own course, because he's so much smarter. Reading Obama's view of Putin the same day the Russian leader surprised the U.S. in announcing his decision to immediately withdraw Russian forces from Syria was instructive. And then she goes on and talks about all the things that Obama said in that article. You can go find it online. And she said, that although they sound smart, Obama's statements were utter hogwash. Every month, 100,000 Syri Syrians make their way to Europe. Popular opposition to this deluge of Islamic mi migrants, nearly none of whom has experience with Western liberal culture, is fomenting the rise of nationalist forces in country after country as the success of Germany's far-right AFD party in Sunday's regional elections made clear. But Obama remains unmoved as he sees it, the threat that racist Americans will respond to the threat of ISIS with racism directed against Muslims is greater than the threat that ISIS poses to the U.S., its allies, in the global order. You know, she's, she's right every week. <laughs> and this brings us to the heart of the principles that guide Obama's foreign policy. Obama's belief, she concludes with this, you can read the whole article in Friday's Jerusalem Post, Obama's belief in America's moral turpitude is eagerness to trample U.S. credibility, reject traditional U.S. policy goals, his refusal to see the dangers inherent in his radical policies or acknowledge their failures, let alone accept responsibility for their failures, and his trampling of U.S. allies while appeasing its enemies all point to Obama's true doctrine, which is he hates the United States. And he has other things at plan. So... Um, Israel, just real quickly, in the last couple minutes here. Uh, Israel, um, you see what their top concern is? Here in the article on the right. It says, Israel's top concern in Syria. It's Iran, not the Islamic State. So Putin's venture hasn't solved anything. I know that Netanyahu's on his way to Russia right now to have some talks with Putin. Uh, I will give props to this organization. I'm not sure familiar with them, but they had this uh, full-page ad in the New York Times the other day. Hillary Clinton must disavow her anti-Israel advisors. And it talks mainly about Max Blumenthal, who had her private email address and talked to her and suggested all sorts of things like maybe we can create some disruptions in the, in the West Bank and the Palestinian areas and, and hurt uh, Netanyahu's government, ability to govern. In the articles his father sent Clinton, Max Blumenthal, an active supporter of the anti-Semitic boycott divestment sanctions movement, this is what the ad says, revoltingly compares Israel to Nazi Germany. His book, Goliath, is full of reference to Israel's Nazi mentality, Israel's as Judeo-Nazis, and the, Israel, the Israeli army as Nazi SS. He's a friend of Hillary. Now, um, is CNN covering this? Is anybody covering this? Nobody's covering this. And that's the problem with the Republican debate, this, the Republican fight over the nomination. She's walking scot-free. And she should be indicted, frankly. But uh, this is the way it is. Um, here's a Melanie Phillips article. I'll probably close with this. She has an article in, I think it was uh, in the Jerusalem Post the other day, the EU's illegal settlements. Now, how much have you heard in the news about illegal Israeli settlements in the Palestinian areas? A lot, right? But then what you hear is what? 
oh, those evil Israelis, they go in and destroy these homes of the Palestinians. Okay, how did they build those? The EU provided the funding, EU NGOs provided the money, built the homes illegally. So Israel is acting to protect itself. These settlements, which fly the EU flag, which fly the EU flag in Israel and display its logo on their structure to be found in more than 40 locations in Area C. According to the Israeli NGO, Regavim, which maps this activity between 2012 and 2014, more than 400 of them were constructed within the Adumen area near Israel, near Jerusalem alone. Under the Oslo Accords, Area C is to be administered by Israel. The EU settlements constructed without Israeli permission and against Israeli zoning laws are therefore illegal squatter camps. Israel regularly demolishes these structures. And they should, because they're illegal. Uh, next week, I'll talk a little bit about some of the Western hypocrisy with regard to Gaza. So what do you take away from all this? World's in a state of flux. Apostasies rising in the church. Economies in turmoil. World geopolitics are in turmoil. Every, I mean, I even talked about North Korea launching missiles and Iran launching missiles. And it's, it's all, it, look, it can be very troubling. I'll admit that. So what do we need? We need to stay close to the Lord in this time. That's our, that's our only refuge. And, and personally, what I think the Lord is doing is I think that the Lord is decoupling. Do you know what decoupling means? Like when you pull two rail, railroad cars apart? Decoupling the remnant, the faithful remnant church from the world. And I think that's a significant thing that's happening. And I think his true church, his true believers, his true followers are going to be driven more and more to him than ever before. But a lot of people, they're not going to get it. Especially if they've got pastors coming out of seminaries like Claremont Lincoln, where knowledge isn't that important. Wow. God's a God of love, but his love is based in truth. And people need to get back to that. So let's pray and let's uh, go have lunch. Lord, again, we're so grateful for your word, your instruction, your prophecies that give us an anchor on which to hold in this time. And Lord, I just pray that you would use these events in the world not to trouble us, but to draw us closer to yourself and that, we'll, and that we will flee to the refuge that we have in the Lord. Bless us as we go this week, in Jesus' name, amen.